And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, to the Weighing In Podcast. We are absolutely enthralled and excited about having our next guest, a man who is a legend of the pioneers of the lightweight division, a guy that does not get near the credit that he deserves for everything that he did as a fighter, then as a trainer, now as a commentator. He's doing it all, all the time, everywhere. You, the man doesn't get to go home at all. <laughs> Dean Thomas, you are a busy, busy dude. Man, listen, I love the intro. Thank you very much. And You're welcome, I do sir. all those it. things, but the one thing I can never get right is the lighting of my <laughs> I can never I can never get the visuals. Sometimes the uh, audio I can't get it right, but I can never get the visuals right. I mean, you guys are you fantastic, are, but I'm just here when just you trying are to as, keep up. Look, when you're as cool as you, the light is always shining on you, baby. I always look <laughs> like I'm doing, I always look like I'm doing a podcast from prison. You know what I'm saying? I got like <laughs> prison light on me. That's exactly what it is. You're in a five star hotel right now, but it looks like a prison ba- in the bathroom stall. Actually, in a prison, like you're chuck, yeah. you're you're hidden away in there, like this, yeah. just flexing the arms though, so we can all see them guns. <laughs> Look at him; he's just like he's got the light light shining on his guns. <laughs> it feels like that. The the t shirt is too tight. I am right in front yeah. of the bathroom, but but nah, man, I'm living good, man. I can't complain. I'm still in the space of MMA doing what I love. I can't do anything else in life, so I'm just happy to still be here. That shirt you probably bought when you were still fighting, huh? Because it looks like a medium. <laughs> unless you st- unless you started shopping at Baby Gap, I no, mean that's man, really it's, what. <laughs> it's definitely too small. <laughs> uh, that's great. You just landed in Singapore, correct? Yeah, I, j- I just landed in Singapore. I'm here with oh, Karate God. Combat, and uh, just. Just trying to do my thing, man. Just trying to enjoy life to the fullest. I love it, man. I I, I love Singapore. It's clean. The trans- public transportation system is the best in the world. I mean, everyone there speaks English. I mean, I know the Chinese, like Mandarin is kind of their first language. It's actually more their second language because you can't get a job there unless you speak English. Really? But, See, uh, I didn't know all that yeah. much, but I did oh, know yeah. that it's like super clean and yeah. kind of expensive in a lot of places. But oh, yeah. but man, you're right. It's a it's a good place to just be. When I was there, I was working for one for a while, and when I was there, I was talking to some of the locals, and they were saying that it costs about seventy five thousand U S dollars to even put your name on a list to be able to get a vehicle. So oh then you God. put you put seventy five thousand dollars to put your name on a list, it's like a lottery, and you put your name on a list to get it to be able to have a vehicle. And then when you get there, like a Honda, right? A normal Honda that costs us sixteen to twenty thousand. This was back then. Now it's like forty. Okay, but a normal Honda will cost you know us here in the states about fifteen to twenty grand back then. It cost them fifty to sixty grand Ooh. because oh to God. ship it there to get it through the ports to basically it's uh, not that it's farther from Japan to the U.S. But to it ship the, it, but to to register it there because right they don't, around the corner. Yeah, they don't want a lot of vehicles, so oh. it's it, it really is kind of the haves and the haves nots when if you're driving a vehicle. Yeah, you're you, a lucky son of a yeah, gun. You, yeah, you're if, you, if you got a car out here, you're rich. <laughs> yeah, you're rich. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So and that, that's so funny because a lot of them are like, hey, well, why would I want to just spend all that money to have a Honda? I might as well get a Benz or a Bentley or a you see a lot, you'll see a lot of Mercedes there. Mm, a lot that of makes Mercedes, a lot of sense. Lot like of, if you if you're gonna go all out, you gotta go out. Yeah, you might as well. I've said when I was there, I mean, I was it was like Maserati was kind of making I know Maserati's been around for a while, but they it seemed like they had just got a huge influx of Maseratis when I was there. It was like Maseratis and uh, and Bentleys were everywhere. I don't care where you're at. You're driving a Maserati. You're doing okay. You're doing all right. <laughs> you're doing all right. So, uh, but hey, you just landed. You're there, you know, and uh, you're there for Karate Combat, correct? Yeah, Karate Combat got a show going on Wednesday. And if you've never been to a Karate Combat, I recommend going to a Karate Combat. It's such a party. It's so fun. The production is cool. The rules are cool. Very easy to understand. It's very easy to watch too because it's inside a pit. So yeah, karate pit combat cool. to me is is the next wave of combat sports. So what you you're a, saying is the Kumite had it right then, yeah. right? <laughs> no, it no, is. Yo, I mean, so Kumite, Kumite was a raised platform. You got to go back, yeah. and I hate to say this, I hate to give him credit. It's going to bother you, but Frank Shamrock yes. did did that first with that type of pit he did 
you know, and that was in like a bowl, did. right? Wasn't it there? Was in like a bowl? No, no, no. It, that it was, was that was yacht. That was the Yama. Oh, thing. <laughs> Frank's was exactly what Karate Combats is, except Karate Combats has a little bit higher wall to it. Yeah, mm. as far as the pit itself, just a little bit more. But Frank's, it was. I want to say it was called Shootbox. It was. But it was. He had was some called? wild ideas, John. Though he wanted to have alligators or sharks as, as a moat around it. He <laughs> want. Yeah, he was like, I want to have a moat. Around it, and I want to have alligators or sharks in the moat. Yeah, that's always good. That's always good for your. I customers. was like, uh, he's like, yeah, and you, you like, you can just throw them over into the. I'm like, I, I thought he, he was joking. Been he was like, no, 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 he was. Oh, like, he's serious. Frank is Frank is a strange bird, brother. Man, strange <laughs> CTE <bird>. is real. <laughs> yeah, oh, just, dude, is it he's not just a strange yeah. bird? <laughs> he, yeah, he. But uh, man, I mean, he yeah, he was the one. Mike Swick fought on that card. I want to say Bobby Southworth fought on the card. There was a couple of our guys that fought on that card out of AK. Yeah. yeah, he had the whole idea back in the day, man. It was a square, and he had made it where it was raised on the sides. Like, yeah, so then you you can you you can run off of that and kick. You can Jump you know it's like and people it, yeah. can't just hip escape away. They can't use the they can kind of use the wall to get up, but it's not like using the wall. And he he was uh the thing with Frank Shamrock. He was an he innovator. Was innovative. He yeah. was very smart about a lot of things, mm -hmm. but he just was not a good business person. He had a hard time doing business with people. He well, just, he like, burn, yeah. burn bridges. I'm not going to sit there and say he's not a good business person. He is not easy to do business with. There you go. <laughs> How's that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that there, kind of the, the same thing, though, John? Good. Isn't that kind of the it, same thing? It can be. <laughs> it can be. But he's done good business with certain people, and he's gotten along with certain people. He's done very well, so good for him. And uh, he is the guy that started that. But Karate Combat has really made yeah. it. Uh, to where it is their their platform that everyone expects to see it's and it, i think it's a cool platform yeah have, have you guys been to one i mean i know they travel i and i have not been to one but i've watched them yeah so what they do is they they kind of follow where the crypto people are like the crypto conventions and then they also have like crypto guys fight and if you've never seen crypto <laughs> guys oh. fight it's uh, oh, it's yeah. awesome it's awesome. What? No, I'm not it's, kidding you. Did you just say it's, it's awesome? got to be like celebrity boxing, right? No, it's, uh, it's funny it's like kind that. Of like, it's kind of like, it's awesome in a sense that street beefs is awesome. You know, they're yeah. just like, they don't know what they're doing. So you don't really expect a lot from them. But, yeah. but they're used to like high pressure situations. So they don't get nervous and they mm. get tired really fast and they fight through it. And there's nothing more exciting than watching somebody <laughs> that's really tired still trying yeah. to fight. And that's and that's Man. what makes it also. I mean, they can't fight, but it's still like the the that's, the that's visual. usually my problem with it. Yeah, I always say, watch you know, it's like watching people that can't fight try to fight is like it's no stop, please don't. Do do they put any like crypto on the line? Like, hey man, if you beat me, I'll give you like a thousand of my crypto <laughs> in this Bitcoin, man. Yeah, but, yeah I'll give look, you like a half of a Bitcoin. Like, I I don't know if they have like those little deals under the table, but I think that that's a lot of bragging rights in the industry. Oh, yeah. So like these guys are fighting each other and this is it's fun to watch. Uh, I saw I, they did a show in Dubai. I want to say I, I can't say for sure it was out of the Burj Khalifa, but it was in an incredibly high, uh, you know, skyscraper. Yeah. It like they took over the entire floor of this thing and put their the thing in there and had had fights. And I was like, how much is that costing them? Yeah, because they, they didn't have that many people there. It was like yo, you were invited to it crazy yeah i don't i honestly i don't understand talk about business like and frank <laughs> I, I don't know how the business works of it but I, yeah. I know it's like a lot of crypto stuff but i know it's got to cost some coin to throw these shows yeah boss yeah. Rudin's a big part of that thing yeah yeah boss is a big part of it <laughs> he's awesome george st pierre a boss um i mean they've brought on some some solid names to endorse it and it's but like i said the most important thing is it's fun it's it's yeah. a lot of fun, especially on the outside. Like where, you know, like some MMA shows can get real tense since a lot of mm. beef going on, but there's no real beef here. Like the fighters do, but then when the cameras are off, they're all mm -hmm. sweethearts. Yeah, I mean that's like it. It really starts with building like a family. I mean, Dean, you remember the back of the day in the UFC, we were all there to fight each other, but we were all at the bar afterwards together, having drinks, hanging out. You know, people were people enjoyed being around each other, even though we knew we were there to fight. We, we all liked each other. Majority. Yeah, I, I mean, there was a couple. Yeah, that yeah. Were, I don't want. That's why I don't understand some of the fight culture now where. Yeah. I mean, it, I would think that they'd be happier now because they make more money. Like, why? Why are you crying? <laughs> a lot more. You, a lot they more. They make money. a lot more money now. <laughs> and they're so angry. Like, what are y'all angry yeah. about? You make a lot of money. I don't get it. 
I don't get uh, it. I'm like, like you, you guys have enough to do everything that you want to do in your third fight in the UFC. Like we were, we were fights like eight fights deep or five fights deep, whatever. We're like, man, we're scrumming by trying to get trying to get extra cash. I know like, we were taking fights in between UFC I fights. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, right. We, had, we we all had like real jobs and yeah, and, you know, sleeping on couches and yeah, it was rough. Yeah. I don't know why no, these guys no. get I mean, so angry now. I, like I was signed to the UFC. I got injured. Then, you know, back then they only had five, seven fights a year in pay-per-view, right? And that was it. So if you missed a fight because you had to pull out because of the injury, you had to wait like two more fights because they already had those two fights booked, you know? And there was only about eight fights on the card. There was like yeah. four prelims and five on the main fight. And, <clears throat> and so I had to take a WFA fight with Rob McCullough. I fought Rob McCullough in the WFA. Because and and Joe Silva's like, don't lose. If you lose, we're cutting you. Oh. And I was like, yeah, but I need money, man. So I gotta pay yeah. my rent. Like, you know, I gotta pay my rent. Josh, I uh, no so one has suffered rough. more a career hit than you from injuries. Yeah, probably. I had a lot of injuries. I mean, I did a lot of it was some of it was due to Frank Shamrock, man. That was <laughs> that fucking guy. He was the original you know? TJ Dillashaw, huh? Just, yeah, oh, he was actually oh, like dude. I had I had him, I had him, BJ Penn, uh Bob Cook, uh Dave Velasquez, uh, you know, Charles Taylor. Those were like my main Kelly Delante. Those were my main training partners for a long time. Until guys like John Fitch, Josh Koscheck, Mike Swick came in. They were a little bit more controlled, you know. Fitch and Cost were pretty controlled for for being so, you know, dynamic with the wrestling, they can control you. They could, you know, learn, they knew how to work. Mm -hmm. Swick had his moments, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Frank, man, Frank had no mercy, man. He was like, Oh, let me just choke you till you pass out. I'll wake you up and I'll choke you out again. He was that kind of person. No kidding. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. No, no. He was, he, I, I tell this story all the time. He was training with Bob Cook. Bob Cook, I think fought in UFC 21 or 22, 27, Tiki, or 27 Tiki Goshen. So they were pummeling against the wall. Bob puts his head down and Frank gets him in a guillotine, chokes him unconscious. And he looks around to see if any of us, because we're all doing wall drills, see if any of us are paying attention. None of us were really paying attention. And all of a sudden, Javier goes, you were. <laughs> I, I saw I saw out of the corner of my eye. I mean, I saw out of the corner of my eye, Bob go limp. And then when he let go, he kind of held Bob up against the, against the wall. And we, he just kept doing the drill with Bob while Bob was choked out, like unconscious. And then Bob wakes up. And just keeps grappling, like didn't go. And then all of a sudden, Bob, it comes to reality. Bob's like, you fucking choked me out, didn't you? He's like, yeah, I didn't have the heart to tell you. So I just kept going. <laughs> like, and Bob's just like, get off me, you know? But it was one of those situations where that was Frank, man. That was yeah. Frank. My farm needs the earth, the air, and the water. I get my energy going on Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. Clean, good tasting energy that feeds me like I feed my plants and animals. And after a long day on the tractor, when it's time to shoot the podcast, I drink elements so that I can stay energized and stay salty. Let's get it on. Man, I'll tell you what, yeah. like those days and like that mentality, it kind of ruined the relationship between coaches and fighters these days i think because it, it gave fighters trust issues because now fighters they feel like when you push them they don't want to be pushed to the point of where how we used to do it yeah and and i get it too like because it was too rough for the way we used to do it you know like some of that some of that uh, stuff but but dean are we creating a soft sport then because I, I, like, that's what i'm across saying the, like across the male platform we're creating weak men I no, for that. sure, for sure. <laughs> but that, but that's my point, though, is that we need to be able to train them hard. Mm -hmm. My point is that we need to be able to train them harder than what they want because nowadays, you know, they got so many luxuries because they got money now. They got all mm -hmm. these luxuries, so they want to be soft in the training, but still want to have the bravado attitude. But it, we got they still have trust issues because of how hard it used to be. Which might have been overkill, let, right? Let me let me ask. Let's go to your career because okay. you had a you had a fantastic career. You had a a run in the WEF, and I don't know how Jamie Levine signed you, but it was one <laughs> of the better things that he ever did. As a guy, I don't want to say anything bad, but you had to know Jamie to understand Jamie. And you had a ten and zero run there. You you beat Jens Pulver coming, you know, and Jens had been the UFC champion. Um, <clears throat> You guys were considered the the top two. I think you were one and two 
in the lightweight division at that time that that fight took place in the WEF. And then you went all the way to be in 10 and 0. Then you came to the UFC and your first fight in the UFC was at UFC 32 against BJ Penn. That's a hell of an introduction into the UFC. (laughs) Damn. <laughs> well, like no one knew at the time, right? Except for maybe I was going to ask you. Yeah. yeah, that's the whole point. I was going to ask you. <laughs> like no one knew at the time. Like at the yeah. time, we thought he was just a jujitsu guy. I mean, there was a lot of jujitsu guys, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm yeah. just getting. I think I'm getting a jujitsu guy. That's what I'm thinking. I who knew he was going to turn out to be BJ Penn. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, Josh. You could have warned me. I know you used to train with him. You could have said, "Hey, man, watch hey. out! This guy can fight for real." Hey, Josh, Josh, Josh was going to tear him up on the, on the, on the ground too. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me give you a little backstory on that. So he used to come in and train during the day when I was still working a nine to five, you know, I was actually working a six to three, a 6 a.m. to three. And I'd come in after it, like say five thirty, six p.m. at night and train, you know, some kickboxing with AKA. And then I'd train jujitsu at night with Frank Shamrock and Bobby Southworth. And they would come in. Bobby and, you know, Mike Swick and Javier was my coach and Bob Cook, you know, was my coach slash training partner. Man, BJ's so good. BJ's this, BJ's that, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, this dude ain't that good. I mean, he's just a grappler. He's just a jiu-jitsu guy. They brought him in one night because I was like, bro, there's no way this dude's subbing me. Like, he's not subbing me. Like, maybe he'll catch me, sure, whatever, but he's not. Man, we touched hands. I kid you not. It was like less than 25 seconds. He fucking had my back. He had my arm trapped, one arm trapped, and he was choking me with one arm and then letting go and then getting back and getting another... He tapped me, I'd say, five or six times in like a five-minute period. <laughs> you know what I did the next day? I quit. went to my job and I quit. I started training during the day. <laughs> no kidding. Dude, I was like, bro. Gotta... Well, you were going to quit one or the yeah. other. Let's yeah, I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I went to my job and the next day. I was like, I, I, I can't be a part-time uh, fighter. Like, this is not, I'm in the hurt business. Like, this guy is so good on the ground. That, and I was and I was already, I think, a purple belt at the time. Man, he made me feel like I had no jujitsu, None. I had zero jujitsu. It was embarrassing. Yeah. To and this so, day, um, man, I say BJ, to me, he's my top lightweight of all time. I, I'm there with wow. you, man. Yeah. No, nah, everybody you know, goes on oh, Habib and all these other no. guys. Go, it's relative. It's relative. But BJ's it is, but it's, run. It's a lot of, but a lot of it is based upon, you know, BJ didn't fight within his weight class a lot. And that he's got a lot of losses. Well, not, yeah, that's for where, sure. That's where, I mean, pe- that's where people are going, well, look at his record. Well, but I'm, if you understood who he was, especially right. when you fought him, that was a special dude. From that run all the way through, like his whole lightweight run, like yeah, yeah. With, like Joe Stevenson and Sean Shirk. Yep. I mean, it was like the next guy, he was just battering these guys. Yeah, it it wasn't even close. So that's why I say, you know, he was just different. He was different. You could tell when he was motivated, John. I mean, Dean, like you could tell when he was motivated. Look, you saw when he was motivated. Joe Daddy Stevenson's Mm -hmm. Kenny Florian, Sean Sean Shirk. You saw when he was motivated. He was definitely motivated. Yeah, you know, uh, Diego Sanchez. You could tell when he was motivated. It's like, man, these guys are not on my level. Then when you put, and no disrespect, because he's one of my closest boys in the sport, is Frankie Edgar. He was like, man, this guy's too small. If he's not, if he does take me out, he's not doing anything. I had trained with Frankie, and I knew how damn good Frankie was. He was hard to take down. He was hard to hold down. And when he did take you down, he was like, he had like cat-like reflexes. You'd kick him off of you, and he'd spring back before you could get up because he was a smaller lightweight. But, man, his hands were fast. He had a little bit of power for having fast hands and being such a small guy. I was like, man, this is not as easy of a fight as you think it's going to be. And sure enough, man, I mean, he ended up getting the win. But I think that was a fight, too, where I think BJ thought, ah, I'm going to get him, I'm going to get him. He wasn't motivated for him for the first fight, but I think Frankie got enough knowledge out of BJ in that first fight to make the adjustments he needed in the second fight. You know, I, I just, it was, uh, BJ to me is still the top lightweight. Is he for you? Reason, I, I think from our yeah, generation, absolutely for me. I think from our generation, we just understand that, like we, because we know what it, what it, how different he was compared to everybody else. Well, here's here's the other thing: is I trained with both of them for a long time, Habib and and uh, BJ. I put the two of those guys at the top. <clears throat> One being that he was wild and crazy. BJ was okay. He would go in and train with guys, train with guys like Randy Couture. He you know, and he would be able to control them on the ground. You know, and, and be able to do things to them on the ground. I seen him train with the uh, with top level guys that would, would come in AK. BJ saw the same thing with Habib. The difference was is that BJ didn't care where you wanted to fight him. He'd fight you in the back alley. 
Mm-hmm. And that's been proven too. Okay. He'd fight you in the back alley. He didn't care. He'll fight you anywhere, anytime. Let's scrap bro. It was real. That was the real. Now I know that Habib probably would have done the same thing, but he was a very more comma, even kind of even mellow kind of person. Hey guys, we don't want to fight. Hey guys, you know, like this, that kind of, you had to really do something to him. But I would say that BJ was the wild one that would fight anybody, anytime. Didn't matter the weight class. Habib, he was a very structured on what his career was. I'm going to fight this way, get to 30 and 0. And then I think if his dad wouldn't have passed, he'd still be fighting. I think he would have fought, maybe not right now, but another two years, I think, or a year or two, he'd still be fighting. I think he would have went up to 170. I think he would have had a good career at 170. The most dominant, and John says this too, and I think I got this idea from John. He's the most dominant fighter to ever step foot in the cage, ever. Habib yeah, is. For sure. Over John Jones, over yeah. all those guys. He is the most dominant fighter. Now, I'm not saying that he would he's better than John Jones. I'm saying that he was the most dominant fighters. He didn't re- outside of the Gleason T Bell fight, give me another fight that was really close. No, nah, you're right about that. Yeah. He was the most dominant fighter, not just lightweight, but of, of all time, right? Like there's no one who had the career he had from beginning to end and has yeah. been able to dominate the competition the way and he dominate has. good fighters. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, dominating good fighters, like the next best yeah. guy up, right? But still, but there's still something about that run that BJ had. Yeah. It was just, there was even just, I think the intensity of that run can't be matched by anybody. When you, I, I when agree. You, when you signed to fight him, though, you had a trainer in Howard Davis. I don't know if people remember who Howard was, but he was an Olympic gold medalist in boxing in the 1976 Olympic team. He was a phenomenal boxer. He was your coach in the stand-up for a lot of uh, your career. And then I know it's you separated after a while, but your stand-up became really outstanding from well, the point so that, where I so saw honestly, you but, him. So that was actually before I started working with Howard Davis. Okay. Yeah, so okay. that was before. How? But Howard really helped me out with a lot of boxing stuff. I mean, and he really, I attribute a lot of my growth in striking the Howard just because he understood it and he loved us. Like there's a, there's a difference between like working with a coach who's just trying to get paid and a guy who who you could tell had genuine love for you and wanted to see you get better. And that resonated with myself and the other guys that worked with Howard because we wanted to be there because we knew he wanted to be there. So it worked for all of us, man. And, And I attribute a lot of my striking prowess to Howard Davis just for that reason. It makes a big difference when you attach yourself to a coach that generally cares about you. Like you care about him. He cares about you. You feel that, that love, like in the corner, you feel it, you know, in the back when you're warming up, like you can tell that they don't have much to say. The jitters are getting to them as much as they're probably getting to you as a fighter. You're more excited to walk out there and fight. He's more kind of nervous that nothing happens to you. You know, I had that with Bob Cook. Javier would be like that in some fights. Javier would be like that, but Bob Bob was pretty much like he looked at me like a little, like a, almost like a son, but a little brother. And it was one of those you could tell. He's like, "Are you okay? I'm good." Like he was always asking me, "Everything good? You okay?" He knew that everything was out of his hands. But to have that kind of relationship with the people in your corner is very important. I see that a lot with the guys with Mike Brown on American Top Team. They love yeah, Mike. They Brown. love Mike. He's always had that relationship with fighters. Yeah. Because he never, like the fighter in him never left. So yeah. they always saw him as a fighter. They don't even really, they look at him as a coach and they call him coach mm-hmm. because he has that fighter thing about him and and they can sense that. And that was, that was one of the issues I had with top team because I didn't have that really. Like when I was done fighting, I was done fighting. I started like hating fighters. So it was really, it was, and it was hard for me to coach him. I get him. it. Yeah, you get it, right? I get it. Like, so it was hard for me to coach him. But, much less love them, have love for them. So it's, yeah. and that's why even now I only work with a couple of fighters. Like I so you're still in the corner a couple. a couple times. Yeah. I work, I'm invested in two fighters and I consult with like a half a dozen. Well, who are the two that you're invested with? Uh, Jillian Robertson and Sean mm-hmm. Brady. Yep. And uh, yeah. So man, yeah, man. I've, yeah, I've been able to attach myself to some, some decent yeah. talent and they've welcomed me in, but and, but I consult with like Aljamain Sterling and a couple other guys. Mm-hmm. But outside of yeah, that, like maybe, I just, maybe you could talk Aljo out of disliking me. <laughs> he doesn't like you. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't like me. No, why? I mean, look, <laughs> I said some things about him after the whole the first Peter Yan fight and the whole looking around. 
and like a little bit of that, a, a little bit about the acting. Yeah. I was like, bro, you are a fighter. You've been needing the head on the ground and in, in in the gym quite a bit. You didn't act like that. Now I love that. I love Aljo, man. I think he's a fantastic yeah, he's fighter. Phenomenal. I've always liked him, even before he that fight. You know, but. That, that rubbed him the wrong way, man. I got nothing but respect for the dude. No, so. no. I'll, I'll I'll see if I can't mend that. You know how fighters are. You can so mend sensitive. that if you. Yeah, uh, fighters are so sensitive. You know he was, this. He was very. He was very. What was funny is you know we. I, I can't say it. He did a video basically I, calling me out. Go, man. I used yeah. to like oh, you yeah. as a fighter, man. You yeah, same as me. He called me out. Oh, he called you out too, John. Yeah, he was mad. Oh, yeah, he didn't like he me at all. Stuff. Was, <laughs> I like Aljo though. I was a though. bad person. Well, they gotta understand. It's all good. Our job now is to talk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and to be honest. And to be honest, right? So and this and to go. speak our mind and speak our opinion. That doesn't mean that we're yeah. always going to be right. That's right. No. But no, we have not. to say what's right for us in the moment. So I get it too, man. I you know, I said some things about John Jones. He saw me at, at the at the sphere the other day and I knew he didn't say nothing. But I knew he knew. <laughs> John doesn't like anybody. And Bro, I knew, he's, I knew, he's on, he's knew, on an island I knew he knew. And I was like, yeah. I was like, oh man, he's gonna come over and punch me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, you you know when you see them across the room, yeah, right? I'm they like, look at you and like they don't like smile. So they know you know that they know something like yeah. they're, they're mad. They're like they're, they're mad. Just bothered, like, perturbed. Oh man. Because I yeah, went like, I went hard on them too. Again, oh. you know, we're in a position to where we have to talk. And yeah. sometimes when we start talking, we we get a little reckless at times. And <laughs> <laughs> even when you don't. Hey, we're, at least trying. we're not <laughs> We're not skip Bayless though. We're, we ain't that bad. Look, yeah, I'm not that bad. But no, I mean, we ain't that bad. I mean, I had I had a I had a moment I was on the desk working at ESPN show. And we were talking to Tom Ashman on John Jones, mm -hmm. you know, and I went on there and I was, you know, I was like, John, I'm like, I'm not saying that he's afraid of him, but he's being a coward, you know, and I went, I, I mean, I, oh. went, I, went, I went a little, I went a little, you know, a little Stephen A on it. So, <laughs> 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 but, you know, I, I had, but that's, I think what separates me from other people is that. Hey, let me, I'm let me ask okay. you this, since you were there, I in watching the sphere, like I, I, I put out a tweet saying something that affected, like I've been all over the world and I've been to the, all the great arenas really that there have been. And from what I'm seeing, that is the coolest place I've ever seen an MMA show done at. It, it just, looks yeah, it, nothing comes close. Amazing. Yeah, nothing, nothing comes close. Yeah. That's what um, I thought. You could feel every dollar that they put into it, and you could see, yeah. <laughs> and you could see why. And there was, was a lot of those, yeah. Oh, yeah. and you could yeah. see why they'll probably never do it again, yeah, because yeah. It, it was absolutely just mind blowing. Like to see this get done, it was mind blowing. And in fact, <clears throat> from a from a working standpoint, I had a hard time actually even paying attention to the fights at times. Cause it was so yeah, like I'm like I got I'm here for a job like I stay on I, the I, monitor I, yeah. I looked at it, I said, can you imagine standing in the cage, you're getting ready to fight, and you look off to your right or to your left, and there is you, fifty some feet tall yeah, yeah. With, and you got to look and go, holy shit, look yeah. at that! Yeah. I said you can't even concentrate on on your fight. Yeah, it, you know, it was a bit distracting. It's funny, Dana says. um, you know, they'll never go back. And I can understand that for now. I just don't want to use the word never. Just like no, women no. will never fight in the UFC, right? He'll but go back. This is, but I think they're going to go back. Because let's just be, let's be honest. The technology is going to change. And when it changes, that place won't be as expensive as it used to, as it is now. Right. So they'll start lowering the prices. Less people will stop going there if they keep their prices high. Like, I mean, with inflation, it will still cost quite a bit. But he'll be making it up in terms of money-wise in, in, the, in the UFC budget. Yeah, think, they'll go back. Let's just sure. say, let's just say six, seven years, maybe ten years down the line, when that technology is kind of getting a little bit more obsolete, I could see them returning there again. And plus, you know? they, they, now that they've done it, they know that they can do it, and yeah. they know that it can be done, and they probably it'll probably be easier for them to do it the next time. So they can cut some costs, cut some costs, that, hey, and just like you know, I, I think that they were doing like so many rehearsals to make sure they could pull it off. They could probably cut back on some of the rehearsals now. Because they know that yeah. it, it can be done, so I think they'll go back. I'm not sure when or anything like that, but you're right about that. Never say never, yeah. especially with that. Never say never. Yeah, that's why we got women in the MMA now, right? Yeah. In the UFC, yeah. and <laughs> hey, they, they, they my favorites to watch too. Actually, 
It tear it up. I, I got a little funny thing I want to ask you about is, uh, you know, you were sitting next to Habib one day because we were talking about him. Yeah. And he's like, hey, man, didn't you fight my my teammate, Josh Thompson? Yeah. He got you mixed up with these Edwards. What was the first <laughs> thing? What was the first thing that went through your mind? I said, man, I, I get this. I mean, I was embarrassed, actually. <laughs> I really I really was kind of embarrassed because, you know, I've been in a game for so long. Right. And to have a guy like Habib just not know who you are, right? And it got and it got worse too, as he said it. He's like, "Yeah, you fought my uh, my teammate Josh." And I said, "No." I, and the cameras are right there too. This is on yeah. the so I couldn't hide it. The cameras right there. No. And I was like, "No, that was um that was Eve Edwards." And then um Matt so the Matt Sarah's there. He's like, "No, nah, he fought me." And and Habib looks at me, and goes, "You fought." <laughs> <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I'm like, man, I, I was so embarrassed. I was like, I fought a professional career 15 years, and here's the best oh. lightweight of our of our generation talk about you fought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you know what's it's funny though, right? Because yeah. <laughs> he was like 26 or 27 at the time when that all happened. So when you're you're hey, these young kids, they just don't they don't. They don't pay attention yeah, really to the yeah. history of it all. Nah, I get you it. Know? I get it. They you got to figure he was three years old. When he was <laughs> yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How old? How old is Habib now? I think he's 34, 34, 34 33, or, oh, yeah, 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 somewhere in there. Yeah, I think he's thirty three, yeah. thirty four, somewhere. You got to figure. I'm being honest. Off of, uh, I want to say it was your fight. We're getting on a bus because we had the bus after. Uh, to go take us back to the hotel bj walks on and i'm sitting in there i have my wife is sitting next to me and he looks at me and goes mr mccarthy i just want to say i've been watching you since i was a little kid <laughs> and i was like Th thanks bj right yeah and it's one of those you know that was bj and so bj's considered an old guy now and i'm like i know I'm so old yeah. and it's, to all this stuff but it's crazy Josh, do you get that a lot too? Like the young guys, like just not knowing that you fought before and just think of you now as a voice. Uh, you know, yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, they, I think a lot of, a lot of people try on online, like social, like they, they try to, to, they try to remind people like, Oh man, Josh was, you know, he was so good. This and that they, they basically say like, he never got the respect he deserved. A lot of people will say that, but I think a lot of people too, like, Outside of, I would rather be remembered for my three fights with Gilbert instead of the Nate fight. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But more people watch the Nate fight because Strike Force was on Showtime. Not a lot of, not everyone was privy to having Showtime. And my fight with Nate Diaz was on Fox. And that was huge because it was one of the first fights. It was like Fox 7, I think, or something like that. that first was fight the very, of the night, yeah. too. For, yeah, on, the, was, on the, uh, yeah, so that got a lot more attention because it was huge that UFC was now on Fox and it was Fox 7. And then on Fox 10, I fought Benson. So there was a lot of like name, you know, they came along, a lot of recognition that came along with that. But, um, but for you to but, yeah, Gilbert I think a lot stand out, right? <clears throat> to me, those ones do the most. That was the ones that I took the most damage in from pretty much my whole career. Oof. You know, outside of the Tony Ferguson fight, I never took a lot of damage in any of my fights except for the Gilbert fights. Mm -hmm. None of them. You know, Clay Guida cut me under the eye pretty bad, uh, but there was no broken orbital or anything like that. I wasn't cut anywhere else, just a swollen eye. Uh, I didn't even have a fat lip, nothing like that. Um, the gill fights, except for the first one, I mean, I walked away more with fucked up feet because I kicked his elbow so many times, you know? Um, you have fucked second, up feet just from birth. They, I do have fucked up <laughs> Flintstone feet, man. I have Flintstone feet, man. I tell the story about how LL, LL Cool J on on CBS. Um, oh, dude. Called? The uh, hit that show that he does in there. NCIS. NCIS LA. The, he, has a, he has it in his contract. You can't show his feet, so he can wear booties and stuff. Uh, he's like, yeah, my feet are fucked up. LL Cool J. <laughs> so really? I say, man... <laughs> Yeah, that's what he said. He's like, yeah, because he was doing an MMA fight with booties yeah. on. I'm like, you can't he wear was. those. He's like, yeah, it's in my contract. You can't show my feet in anything we do. He's like, I got fucked up feet. <laughs> and I was like, I go, man, I go, I go, if I end up being a regular on this show, I'm going to have that in my contract too because I got some jacked up Flintstone yeah, feet, yeah. man. My feet are like really wide and like they're a size. I wear a size 11, but they look like they're like a size five because they're so wide. And my toes are like that big because just from all the years of kicking, just they all the broken bones or spurs in them and stuff, man. They're fucked up. So <laughs> yeah, I get in the cold plunge now. Like it, the only thing that makes me get out is 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 that my feet hurt so bad because of all the all the scar tissue. Yeah, no it hurts the my my legs don't hurt my bot my back my body feet. all that stuff. It's my feet. My feet hurt so bad. 
I have to get out within like two minutes, three minutes, man. It's horrible. It's painful. Damn. Just my feet. If I leave my feet out, I can send a cold punch for 15, 20 minutes. I love it. Dean, you've had, like we talked about your career, you had a phenomenal career. If you were going to pick one fight that you were the proudest of, which one would it be? Oh, man, that's, so, that's such a tough question. Um, but I always I always bring back to in, in Shudo when I fought Mishima. Okay. And that was just because like, I was getting my ass kicked. I mean, I was getting beat up pretty bad, and I was able to come back from that. So there's something there's something about being able to come back from that and telling yourself that you're tough and like having that moment where you realize that you're tough, especially in front of people too, because it's so easy to quit in front of people. I pick yep. Jeremy Stevens as one of your highlight fights in the fact that you didn't, he was brand new. It was his first fight in the UFC. So you couldn't have known a lot about him and he was putting it on you for a lot of that fight. Mm-hmm. And then you got him in the arm bar. He screamed out. I stopped it. I tell people the story all the time. And he was like, I didn't tap. I said, Oh yes, you did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, the cream is a tap. But, on me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes, it is. But I mean, I, I always looked at that fight as thinking of you and saying, man, that's one of those fights. You were the nail for quite a bit of that fight. That is not an easy thing to do. And you just kept hanging in there, sticking with it and finally got your, your moment. And you pulled it out and you go, that's what a real fighter is. Well, I think that I was able to do that because of the Mashima fight. Like, and knowing okay. that I can endure a little bit, you know, that I don't have to always be a hammer. And that's not what fighting is. It's not just about going out there and being bigger, tougher, and being a hammer all the time. It's about being. It is for to, some people. Yeah, it is for some people. It is for, <laughs> it is it's for a for lot of people, people, actually. There but you go, that's it. but I think I think more importantly, it's about being able to navigate properly through a fight and find your moments. I think and, you and I are on the same page, man. I felt yeah. like when I first started fighting, I I was winning all the fights so easily, and then as the fights got tougher, I always wanted to know was I that was I just good because I was the hammer, and then when I became the nail, like could I fight through it? It's more of a mental thing. I think for our generation, to be honest, we wanted to know if we really were tough. If we were some, that's just the feeling that I got. I needed to know for sure. Was I tough or was I just a bully? Was I someone that could fight out against anybody else on the street? Yeah, sure. I could beat them. Or was I just a bully? But when I got inside the cage against the best in the world, how would I do? It seems like, you know, you want to see if you could dig deep. That's exactly what I wanted to know too. If I got trouble and I got dropped, Hermes Franca dropped me in the third round. I was able to weather the storm. He beat the shit out of me for about two minutes after he dropped me, man. I was face down, ass up, and my face hit the <laughs> canvas, and it woke me It woke me not, up. Not a good place to be No, fighting. and he beat me up for another minute and a half in that fight, man. I was able to weather the storm and kind of finish the round stronger than him, and that was in the third round after I'd won the first two rounds. And after that fight, I was like, that's still one of my more memorable fights to me, if not up there in the number one, number two spots, because that's when I realized, man, I'm good. Like, I'm I'm. I'm not, I'm not someone's going to roll over and give my back and let you just choke me to get away out. You know, and we see that kind of a little bit these days in, in the sport. Now, these guys are not all of them will dig as deep as they could or as they well, should. That's why I, said I have a hard time relating to some of these guys mm-hmm. because we were different. I mean, I guess again, I'm not hating on it. It's just, we no. were different. Like we, like a part of us wanted to fight to see if we were tough, to see how tough we were and, how much we can endure. And it wasn't just about getting a win bonus or trying to get yeah. a, 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 you know, a knockout of the night bonus. It was about, it was about the fight. And those are the fights that I remember the most, actually. Like yeah. with the Jeremy Stevens fight, I cashed out on that one, relatively speaking. Like I got a bonus and, you know, like wow. and <laughs> this is when sponsorships was good. So like I cashed out on that, but that doesn't stand out in my mind. Like some of no. the other ones, like it doesn't even stand yeah. out in my mind. Like my loss to Josh near, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, you know what I'm saying? So, and that was just because for me, it was about the battle and the struggle and the fight and seeing what I was made of and can I win it? If I couldn't, then, you know, what do I need to fix in order to do so? It was, it was never really about, you know, the money and the fame and all that. And that's, so it's hard for me to relate to some of these guys. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to chat with you about, and I don't want to keep you too long, but that is kind of this, the, the understanding of when it's time to walk away. We're seeing it right now with Tony Ferguson, who is 
a world beater of a fighter, you know, throughout his career. I, you know, he beat the crap out of me. And it was, and I'm not trying to say, hey, but I'm saying he had a great run at the lightweight division. Yeah. Supposed to fight Habib a couple times, four or five times, actually. Five it just, times. Yeah, it never came Jeez. to fruition. <laughs> The guys, the guys are stud, okay. But you look at him, and then there's guys that kind of did it right, like guys like Robbie Lawler. It's just not for me anymore, you know. Still has all of his brain cells. Still not ta- not out there taking a ton of damage. Look, it's just time for me to walk away. When did you know it was time? And what kind of what's your thought process on the fighters that are kind of sticking around a little bit too long? See, I know it was time for me. I fought my my last fight was against Georgie Karakanyan and in, in, in Legacy, yeah. yeah. And yeah. somewhere in that second round, I just didn't care anymore. And I felt it. It was like, what am I doing here? I don't even care if I win. I don't care if I lose. I didn't want to, I didn't want to bite his head off. I just was fighting and sparring and going through the motions. And that's when I knew that I couldn't do this no more because this is too dangerous of a sport to just go out there and mail it in. And that's why for me, whenever somebody says, should I retire they're, and they're contemplating that, I always, if you're contemplating it, it's probably time to retire then because like this is too dangerous of a sport and the window of how good you're going to be is not going to be open that long. You're either coming up and then you're having a good run and then you're going back down. Yep. And when you're going back down, you and if you're having doubts about fighting on your way down, it's probably time to give it up because it's not going to be worth it. You know, some guys do it because they're making such good money, and I get that. And then I go, I'll support you, but you got to fight safe. Don't try to get no, you know, performance of the night bonuses. Just fight safe. But guys like Tony Ferguson, to me, you know, they need, for me, I'm like, yo, give it up. It's over. Yeah, it's over. It's not, it's not happening. Like, I don't know what the end goal is. Yeah. I've known Tony for a long time. Tony used to train at my gym for a while. He's a great guy. I love Tony. He's he's out there. He's crazy. And he was crazy when he was young at my gym. And, you know, all the guys hated working with him because he just didn't know any speed besides 100 miles an hour. But there comes that point you look and you go, man, you, you've got to stop. Yeah. And he's he's not going to. Someone's got to gotta make him stop. And right now, you know, I look at the, I, I love the UFC and I love I love how Dana tries to take care of people. But there comes that point. It's like he's done it before, like with Chuck. Hey, you, know, you need to stop. He needs to do that with a couple other guys, too. He got to stop. And I know that's tough for him. I know, but I think somebody, he's got to stop. But my thing is, these guys got to have something else to do, right? And that's probably what it is. They have no other skills, and the, all they know is fighting. I wish they knew something else. I wish maybe they were better speakers. They can get on a mic like us. But... It's just hard because, like, that's all they know in their majority of their adult life. And some of them, if they come from wrestling backgrounds, most of their life has been in combat. And then yeah. to take that away from them, it has to be kind of hard. All right, yeah. but hey, we're going to. Sorry, we get. I, I got to tell you. Jen, Jen's going to come huh? on too here. Yeah. So. There you go. That's someone yeah, you know. Got, but no, there was one last thing I wanted to jump on. For, I wanted to ask you this real quick, though. How did how did the whole fuck it Friday come about? Oh, the, okay. So Dana was doing <laughs> fucking Fridays. Yeah, and, those were those yeah. were awesome. <laughs> They're so good, man. And I'm I'm in a fortunate enough position to where I can kind of pick on Dana, and Dana doesn't get mad. You know, like most guys, if you pick. On oh, Dana, so he's not like like with me and Josh. No, no, he's gonna no. <laughs> you guys, no, you guys, you got, you better be careful. <laughs> Oh, he, he hates us. That's okay. Yeah, but <laughs> yes, but for whatever reason, Dana, you know, he allows me to make fun of him publicly, so I take every advantage that that I can. And when he does a man. he does a fucking Friday, I come out with a suck it Saturday, and I just I love oh, it, man. man. I love it. Like the whole time when you get, when you're doing it, I'm like, man, the outfits you have on, yeah. and oh, my I talk God. about baby gap, but that's yeah. like you, you go to the next <laughs> level. Well, because yeah. the next you know, level was a time when Dana used to wear all them tight ass shirts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like. It, it just made sense. But now, I mean, now yeah. he's in shape, it don't make as much sense, but it's still, I can't change the character. <laughs> Does he want to be in shape? That ain't my problem. <laughs> That's awesome. My last thing is, do you ever miss it? Uh, No, I don't. Just, I, maybe because I'm so involved in it Yeah. On, on this side of it. I never miss it. I never like the, oh man, I wish I could get back out there and get punched in the face. No. <laughs> <laughs> You sound like Josh. Oh, oh no, man. I don't miss it at all, man. I walk yeah. past the cage and hear those guys landing those shots, and I'm like, 
Yeah, Ooh. that's eight. Nine. I know, right? I, I hear that oh. stuff and I'm like, leg kicks. I'm like, what? Oh, never, oh, yeah. never. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is with you and I, we had, I don't want to say I had a too wide of a stance. You had a little bit wider of a stance. And those calf kicks now, I don't know. I don't know if where we'd be in the rankings with those calf kicks. The oh, way they're, I would have. They're just changing the sport. Yeah, they're changing the sport, and like I wouldn't have been able to take them. Like it no. would. It would. I couldn't take them to the thigh. It would have crippled yeah. me to the calf. <laughs> <laughs> I would have. I would have quit yeah. in the middle of a fight. Like now, nah, I'm done. No. Yeah. Dean, I want to tell you, man. I could talk to you forever. You yeah. are an awesome individual. You are an incredible fighter. You are fantastic on the mic. When they go to you, love all that stuff. Have a great time in Singapore with Karate Combat. Thank you for everything that you've done for the sport. You're a phenomenal ambassador to MMA, and I got nothing but love for you, brother. You're, you are still the man. Thank you, fellas. I appreciate you guys. Have me back on anytime. I love I'd you. I'd love to. Love, to. love to. I feel like we could have done this for another two hours. Yeah. Could have. Yeah. It was easy, smooth. Yeah. Hey, man, get some rest or coffee through until the next day. <laughs> Do what you can. <laughs> All right, brother. Best of luck at Karate Combat. And, uh, man, I'm looking forward to talking to you again. Okay? Peace out.